Hi, I'm Jim Smyrniotopoulos, and we're going to be talking about multiple endocrine neoplasia. Today we're talking about MEN type 1. We have no significant disclosures to make. MEN1 is also called Wormer syndrome. People like to remember the three P's because these patients have pituitary, parathyroid, and pancreatic lesions. As Dean Wormer used to say, the deltas are now on double secret probation, and we'll talk more about that later on. In addition to having the three P's, these patients also have cutaneous lesions, angiofibromas and collagenomas. They may have lipomas. They may have adrenal cortical disease, including hyperplasia as well as adenomas. They may get abdominal uh, carcinoids, but they may also get bronchial and thymic carcinoids, and they may have Zollinger-Ellison syndrome from a gastrin-secreting carcinoid, and they develop other CNS neoplasms, including meningioma and ependymoma. Looking first at the skin, the classic lesion that we see in these patients is the angiofibroma. This also occurs in tuberous sclerosis, but they are far less numerous when they are seen in patients who have MEN1. They may also get cutaneous collagenomas. If we think about the goals for imaging, we want to focus on the pituitary for the head, the parathyroid in the neck, and we want to focus on looking for carcinoids in the abdomen and in the chest. Looking at pituitary imaging, about two-thirds of patients will have a pituitary adenoma and will be symptomatic. It may be the first sign of this disease in up to 25% of patients. The overall prevalence of pituitary disease, again, is thought to be 15 to 60 percent of patients. And patients with MEN1 tend to be younger and have larger tumors that are more invasive as compared to sporadic pituitary adenomas. They may have multiple lesions. They may also have hyperplasia. About two-thirds of the pituitary adenomas in MEN1 are going to be microadenomas. Most of these are going to be functional, and most of them that are functional are going to be lactotrophs producing prolactin, which may cause amenorrhea and galactorrhea. About 10% will have growth hormone secretion with gigantism or acromegaly, and only about 5%, or perhaps a little bit more, will have Cushing's disease because of ACTH secretion. In up to 40% of the patients, multiple hormones be produced. Remember, the pituitary gland is about the size of a dime and is located at the top of the clivus. Pituitary adenomas usually occur in adult patients. They are divided into macroadenomas that are larger than 10 millimeters, and they typically present with visual symptoms from compression of the chiasm. These patients may have bitemporal hemianopsia. Microadenomas, by definition, are less than 10 millimeters and fit entirely within the normal-sized pituitary gland. These patients will present because of endocrine symptomatology, most commonly because of a prolactin-secreting tumor, but any of the hormones can cause an endocrine or clinical presentation. The primary questions are whether the patient has a macroadenoma, and if so, is there involvement of the cavernous sinus? Because prolactin-secreting tumors are treated medically with dopamine agonists, localizing them is not of as high significance as it is for the ACTH-secreting corticotroph microadenomas, which must be identified for the neurosurgeon. Although there are several different techniques, the 3D techniques, GRE, SPGR, post-contrast, appear to be the most sensitive. If we look at this case here, the initial MRI was read as negative. In retrospect, there is a small lesion visible. However, on the 3D uh, image, SPGR image, we can see very clearly an area of decreased enhancement located on the left side of the gland. Typically, pituitary microadenomas enhance a little bit more slowly than the normal pituitary parenchyma, and this can be helpful in identifying them. Pituitary microadenomas, again, are going to enlarge a portion of the gland. They may cause deviation of the stalk to one side, but this is not a reliable sign. They may cause upward convexity of the gland, and they may cause erosion of the floor of the cella. Here's a patient that has MEN1 and has an ACTH-secreting adenoma. On the routine imaging, it's very difficult to identify, but we can see that the stalk is deviated towards the right side, and the left side of the floor appears to be deviated downward. So we think that the adenoma is located here in the left-hand portion of the gland. However, in the same patient, when we do 
the SPGR image, we can identify that the actual location of the microadenoma is on the right side of the gland. So in this particular patient, these features are paradoxical and are actually incorrect in localizing the pituitary microadenoma. When we do parathyroid imaging, we want to differentiate between parathyroid adenomas and hyperplasia. There are multiple parathyroid glands in any one of them, or multiple glands may have a parathyroid adenoma. Hyperplasia may involve enlargement of multiple parathyroid glands, and we also have to make sure that we look for ectopic locations of a parathyroid. The most recent parathyroid scan guidelines from 2012 from the Society of Nuclear Medicine show that the common indication is an elevated parathormone level with elevated calcium. There are two primary methods that can be used for scanning, 99 technetium sestamibi or tetrophosmin, localized in both the thyroid and the parathyroid. However, washout of these ligands from the thyroid is faster, and therefore dual phase imaging may show a difference, which is going to be the parathyroid adenoma. Some institutions do dual isotope subtraction imaging using two different radiopharmaceuticals, either Sestamibi, Tetrophosmin, and Protecnitate. Since Protecnitate localizes only in the thyroid gland, if you subtract the Protecnitate image from the combined image, what is left should only be parathyroid activity by the adenoma. So normally the, par the thyroid picks up the Protecnitate, and the thyroid and the parathyroid pick up the cystamibi and the tetrophosmin. But if we subtract the normal thyroid tissue, then the only thing that is left with the activity is going to be the parathyroid glands, and that might be a parathyroid adenoma. If we look at this case, we have the composite image. We've made the normalization here for the technetium intensity. And when we subtract the technetium from the MIBI, we can see the location here of the parathyroid adenoma. We must be very careful to look in the mediastinum. This patient has a soft tissue mass anterior to the arch of the aorta. It has been stained with contrast material. Renographin 76 was given angiographically and achieved a chemical ablation of this parathyroid adenoma. When we think about imaging the pancreas, we were looking for the islet cell tumors. These are APID tumors, amine precursor uptake and decarboxylase. They can be sporadic or part of MEN1 or von Hippel-Lindau disease. They can be functional or non-functional, and a variety of hormones may be produced by pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Zollinger-Ellison syndrome may be associated with MEN1. The vast majority of patients who have gastrin secreting tumors have peptic ulcer disease. However, only a very small minority, less than 1% of all patients with peptic ulcer disease actually have a gastrinoma. The a majority of gastrin secreting tumors are sporadic, but up to a quarter are going to occur in MEN1 patients, and serum gastrin levels can be measured. The majority of gastrin secreting tumors are located in what is called the gastrinoma triangle or the gastrinoma delta, and we'll see a picture of that in just a second. Patients may have multiple gastrin secreting tumors. The sensitivity of endoscopic ultrasound and nuclear medicine octreotide scanning approaches 90%. MR only has a sensitivity of about 50%. So we want to remember to look in the gastronoma triangle. So what is the gastronoma triangle or the delta? Well, this is where ships, planes, and surgeons may disappear. This is formed by the junction of the common and cystic duct, the junction of the neck and body of the pancreas, and the junction of the second and third portion of the duodenum. So we have here the outline of the gallbladder, and we can see the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct coming together. We have the pancreas here. We have the duodenum. And this triangular shape here, this is the gastronoma triangle, or the gastronoma delta, as Dean Wormer warned us about earlier in the discussion. And in this particular patient, we can see in this on block resection that there are multiple pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors as well as one in the wall of the duodenum. And this is fairly typical for patients that have uh, MEN1 syndromes. 
Gastrin secreting tumors are going to be associated with hypertrophy and rugal fold thickening of the stomach, and we want to be very careful to identify all of the lesions that these patients may have. In this particular patient, the gastrin secreting tumor is cavitary, but there are multiple additional tumors in this patient. So we want to look and watch for gastric fold thickening. The imaging for neuroendocrine tumors is best during the arterial phase of a CT bolus injection as opposed to during the portal phase. We can see in this patient here very clearly that there are two enhancing lesions in the tail of the pancreas. However, when we look at the portal phase, it's very difficult to identify these lesions as showing abnormal or differential contrast to the carcinoid tumor. So in summary, multiple endocrine neoplasia can be summarized as the 3P syndrome or Wormer syndrome, pituitary, parathyroid, and pancreatic tumors. So remember the three Ps and also remember the deltas are on double secret probation. I'm Jim Smyrniotopoulos and thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoy the new year.